What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Grafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is Henry Olson, author of Working Class Republican and the Four Faces of the Republican Party. He's a columnist for the Washington Post and the host of the weekly podcast, Beyond the Polls, where he speaks with leading political journalists and analysts about American politics and its presidential and congressional races. This makes him the perfect person to speak to today about a truly unprecedented situation in American politics. I'm speaking, of course, about the anticipated, many would say, impending decision by President Joe Biden to end his 2024 re-election campaign and either pledge his delegates to his vice president, Kamala Harris, or open the door to some kind of mini primary or brokered convention. In the first hour, Henry and I discussed the unique circumstances surrounding President Biden's recent debate performance and the pressure mounting on him to withdraw from the race, including rumors that he may have Parkinson's disease or some other type of neurological disorder that would disqualify him from running in 2024. We also address rumors related to the influence that Hunter and Jill Biden are having on the president's decision-making, why so many Democrats and members of the press appear surprised by the president's condition, who is likely to replace him as Democratic nominee, and how soon that replacement is likely to be made. In the second hour, Henry offers his opinion, backed by polls and decades of political experience, about what the 2024 election will ultimately hinge on and how this election will be remembered in American history. We discuss why Henry believes Donald Trump is well positioned to retake the White House, the people who would staff a Trump administration and cabinet in 2024, who Trump is likely to choose for vice president, and why that choice is so important for his prospects in November. If you want access to that part of the conversation and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second hour of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events and dinners, you can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. And with that, please enjoy this exceptionally informative, important, and timely conversation with my guest, Henry Olson. Henry Olson, welcome back to Hidden Forces. Well, thank you for having me back. So I will have mentioned this in the introduction. Uh, I will have given your bio, but I also want to mention up front that you have a phenomenal podcast that I listen to on a regular basis. It's really helped me not just prepare for this conversation, but also keep up with all the insanity of politics in a really intelligent way. You bring on really great speakers. Tell our listeners again the name of the podcast. My podcast is called Beyond the Polls. It comes out usually midweek, either Wednesdays or Thursdays. It uh, usually runs a little bit under an hour, and you can get it on any of the normal platforms that host podcasts and love to have you listen. Uh, Get lots of fun people. This week is Dana Perino. Next week, the head of the Pew Research Center. So if you into nerdery or whether you're looking for a 30,000-foot view, my podcast works. Yes, I, I cannot recommend it enough. So let's get right into it. There's not really much to talk about today, actually. No, just kidding. So we're recording this on Wednesday, July 10th, amidst all the drama surrounding Joe Biden after his, uh, I guess there's no other way to put it, sort of disastrous debate performance against Donald Trump and all the speculation about not only whether or not he's going to stay in the race, but whether or not he has Parkinson's, what's wrong with him whether or not the Democrats will be able to push him out. A lot of people like me who are not regular followers of politics are also sort of wondering, well, what are the mechanics here? Like, can he just stay in office if he's if he's not well? So we're going to get into all of that. We're also going to get into specifics about the election itself, Donald Trump, VP speculation, et cetera. 
But just kind of high level, how big of a story is this as a political historian, as someone who's been in this business for decades? What does this compare to historically? It's very difficult to say that it compares to anything historically, that we have never had a president who is running for re-election whose health has been questioned in the way that Joe Biden's has been. Certainly there were rumors about Franklin Delano Roosevelt's condition going into his fourth term. But the press being the press, the fact that we were at war, the fact that there was really no alternative to Roosevelt in 1944 meant that it never really got any significant traction. We've had health issues with the president, particularly questions of Dwight Eisenhower going into 1956, where he was running for re-election, but that was a heart attack. It wasn't a question of can he mentally do the job? It was a question of is the guy physically up to it because of a weak heart, and that was put to rest relatively easily. So this is unprecedented. The closest thing we have to this has nothing to do with health, and that's Richard Nixon's impeachment, which is to say that because of the Watergate scandal, he was politically on the downswing throughout 1973, hit Nadir in 1974, and yet he continued to hold on, supported by a rearguard action among Republicans, which collapsed only when finally the release of the smoking gun tape in early August meant that even the most diehard Republicans were not going to hold out in the Senate. So conviction was a fait accompli, and only that was when Richard Nixon finally resigned, when Republican leaders went and said, you can go on your terms or you will go on the Democrats' terms. What do you want? And he, of course, chose his term. So there's really no historical point-to-point -point comparison. As far as how big of a story it is, look, the United States remains the leader of the free world. It remains the preeminent global superpower. There is international conflict in spades between the Israeli-Hamas war and the possibility of a broader conflict, the ongoing war in Ukraine and the threat of war over Taiwan. And you look and you say, is this man who has so much riding on his shoulders, given the American undergirding of defense throughout the globe, can we trust him? Can we trust the people around him? So, yes, this is a huge global story, which everyone is following, whether they are in Moscow, Beijing, Berlin or Brasilia. So I understand that it's ultimately Joe Biden's decision to end his campaign and pledge his delegates to a different candidate, whether we trust him or not. But that said, what are the factions that are lining up to support him? What are those lining up against him and how much leverage does each side have? Yeah, so it is important to restate that under the Democratic primary rules, the delegates were selected via primaries, and 99% of the delegates are pledged to vote for Joe Biden. They cannot force him out. They require him to decide to get out. So the question of leverage is really not a mechanical one, but it is an opinion one. How many people? are willing to go up front and say, we love you, but it's time to go, which is to say he can stay in the race, but the more people who do that with authority, the more difficult it is for him to stay in the race because swing voters will naturally take that as an indication that if the Democratic leadership thinks he's not up to the job, why should I? So that is the sole leverage that people who want him out have, is the erosion of public opinion against him that they can cause by saying, we're loyal Democrats, we love you, but your time has passed. The factions that are lining up so far are the Congressional Black Caucus has largely come out behind him, although one member kind of broke ranks yesterday, and largely the people who are called frontline Democrats, which is, say, the ones under electoral threat of losing, are people who are increasingly lining up either publicly or privately to say, we don't want to be third class passengers on the Titanic when we know there's an iceberg ahead. Let's change the captain and change course before we drown with you, captain. And then you've got all these people in the middle, you know, which is to say largely safe Democrats who nonetheless want to be in the majority and fear Donald Trump presidency. And the most potent people 
are the leaders, either actual or titular, which is why when Nancy Pelosi goes on and says, as she did recently, that she's behind Joe, but won't say he should unequivocally stay in the race, that sends a signal that perhaps the most politically astute speaker that the Democrats have had in decades is someone who will not unequivocally use her authority to keep him in office. Anyone in the Democratic Party knows this, they see this, and that means she's basically daring others who have similar concerns to go out in front of her so she can provide the final push rather than be the snow plow. This is still very much up in the air for Joe Biden. He has not put these concerns to rest and he's not going to put these concerns to rest because everyone saw what happened on that debate stage. Everyone saw what the special counsel said. I won't indict him because I don't think he has the sufficient mental stature to convince a jury that he can form the necessary criminal intent. That's devastating. Yeah, I love that you brought up Pelosi because she was actually, I don't know if you saw this, she was on Morning Joe this morning and she said that it's up to the president to decide if he's going to run and that, quote, we're all encouraging him to make that decision because time is running short, which is really kind of a weird statement to make because Biden was unequivocal in his statement uh, a few days ago about how he is definitely running. So it's almost kind of like she's basically saying, you're not running, Joe. We don't want you to run, but this is sort of the polite way for me to tell you that that's not going to happen. How did you interpret that? That's exactly how to interpret that is Joe Biden issued a two page letter that unequivocally stated I'm in the race. And yet Nancy Pelosi says it's your decision to run. Okay. He has made his public decision. The fact that you're still saying it's your decision to run means you think he made the wrong decision. And she's smart enough not to say it, but everyone reads that signal and knows what she's saying. And so consequently, that simply gives more people who are frontline Democrats or safe seat Democrats to say, It's time. And the more people who come in to say that, the more likely it is somebody like a Pelosi, somebody like a Bill Clinton will come in behind and say, I've been doing politics all my life and I wish it weren't so, but it's time to go, Joe. It's really interesting what's going on with uh, party loyalists, people who are lifelong Democrats. I saw yesterday a video circulating on TMZ of George Stephanopoulos going for a run and what looked like Times Square. And some passerby asked him, you know, what do you think Biden should do? Should he step down? And George said, I don't think he can serve four more years. I watched that video and I honestly felt like it was planted, that he was actually like, that was completely contrived. It was not some random passerby sort of asking him a question. I'm curious if you saw that video, number one, number two, what do you think of it? Yeah, I did not see that video. I've been flying cross country and uh, I know it happened. I have not actually watched it, but of course, It was contrived, you know, in the point that people who are as experienced as George Stephanopoulos don't do this. Random street interviews when they're in the middle of a run. Also, rando people in New York don't necessarily recognize George Stephanopoulos when he's out in his jogging uniform. I encourage people to go see it. So I, I love, you know, just to bring it back to this question that I was asking before about, you know, leverage, who doesn't? I love that you drew this distinction between technically where the leverage is. In other words, you know, Biden can ultimately do what he wants, but there's going to be pressure, a lot of pressure against him to do it that, you know, make him really consider whether or not he could win without the support of the party. But if in fact he is as unwell as some speculate that he is, it begs the question of whether or not he understands his predicament fully, which makes me also ask the question, like, what about the 25th Amendment. I haven't heard anyone talk about this. Is there any argument to be made that his cabinet could actually remove him from office? Well, there has been some minor discussion about that, but here's, to quote the president, here's the deal. The cabinet doesn't have the final say. A majority of the cabinet and the vice president can temporarily remove the president from office for competency concerns. But if the president challenges that decision, It requires a two-thirds vote of both houses to sustain it, which means it requires Republican support to do so. Now, put yourself in the shoes of Speaker Mike Johnson. Kamala Harris has done this. There is however many members of the cabinet, you know, majority plus one. And then Joe Biden says, sustain it. Do you think he provides the votes? No. He goes to Hakeem Jeffries and say, 
you provide at least two thirds of your conference and I'll provide the rest. But if you can't deliver two thirds of your conference, in other words, had you had 100% of the seats, you would have done this. If you can't provide two thirds of the conference, I'm not providing your ammunition to get you out of this solution. We're gonna go down this together or we're not gonna go down at all. And then the same thing is true of Mitch McConnell. Do you think he goes to Chuck Schumer and say, yeah, I've got 49 votes, give me another 18. No, he goes down and says, you provide two thirds of the votes and I'll make up the rest. And so the question is, can they do that? And I don't think they can. I think they can get a majority. If I were the Democrats in this, you know, I might want to say, hey, let's have Joe Biden answer our questions on live television without a teleprompter or a script. You know, in other words, if he wants us to back him, and this is unprecedented, let's have him make the case before it's in the well of the house. But that puts it back on Biden. Can he do something like that? Can he stand in the well of the house for an hour without a teleprompter being able to, even in the middle of the day, answer question after question after question without going through this? The thing is that nobody who is reasonable can look at the president and say that he is perfectly well. This happens too frequently in too many settings. We've seen too much restriction of him. Is it feasible to think that four months from now, we will have election day and that there will be no instances like the one the nation saw on the debate stage. Anyone who thinks that I think is deluding themselves. And it may very well be that President Biden and his inner staff are deluding themselves, or it may very well be that they're engaging in a last ditch effort to cow people into letting him go out on his own terms, which is to say, Losing to Donald Trump, very frankly, but losing without being, in their eyes, humiliated. And I think the more that becomes clear, the likelier it is Democrats in the next three weeks start to pile on and say, we don't want that because it's not just you. And also, I think to the extent that they're complicit in enabling this, they're going to be potentially punished at the polls in November. And so they probably also want to get out ahead of it, irrespective of whether or not he runs. I think also, you know, the thing that I've said is that, and this is, I think, reflected in the questions about was this just one night or is this a quote condition that they keep asking Joe Biden? I think the problem is that old and dying is not a condition. And this also speaks to just my level of surprise around people's surprise. I was telling you about this earlier that like people, me and people in my circle were not remotely surprised at his debate performance. We've seen this already. And we have felt for a long time that he feels like he's old and dying. I, I, at first, I thought he had dementia years ago. I thought he had early onset dementia. But then, you know, I watched him speak more and more. I thought, well, maybe he's just old and dying. You know, he shuffles from place to place. He can hardly get out enough air to go above a whisper. He loses his train of thought. And so because old and dying is not a condition, it's like difficult to point to something specific, which is why the rumors about Parkinson's disease are so, I think, important. And for people that aren't familiar with this, this story, I think, was initially broken by the Washington Post. A reporter there, I think, was looking at White House logs and saw that a physician by the name of Kevin Kennard, who was invited by Dr. Kevin O'Connor, the president's personal physician. Kennard is a neurologist at Walter Reed who specializes in movement disorders, of which Parkinson's is one, that he had visited the White House, I believe, eight times in the last eight months. The White House hasn't given a sufficient explanation about why this doctor has been invited, how often he saw Biden. I think it's been suggested by the White House press secretary that he saw Biden three times as part of his annual physicals, but she was being very evasive in her answers to reporters about this. So let's just talk about this for a second. Is there any substance to these rumors? And what do we know tangibly about Joe Biden's health right now? Why, and why is the White House working so hard to create this impenetrable wall behind which we can't really learn anything? Well, I'm going to read you something that I got on July 2nd. Private, I won't reveal the person. It's a personal friend. Uh, the reason I say July 2nd is because this is before any record of the White House logs came out. This person says, for the record, as a physician, I fully believe that he has a major problem. Of course, I've not done a physical exam or anything of the sort. But the rigidity, difficulty with walking, and expressionless face are all quite characteristic of a handful of disorders, including Parkinson's. It's obvious that the president has a neurological condition that is consistent with Parkinson's. It is confirmed. No one sends a Parkinson expert eight times in the span of six months to visit the White House 
for yucks and giggles. Okay. They do it because they need somebody to help. Why is anybody surprised? Nobody should be surprised because we've seen this over and over. We saw it at the EU or the uh, G7 summit where Biden was whisked away. Biden didn't attend dinners. Biden appeared to wander off in places. We've seen more and more clips of Biden literally freezing and having to be either guided off the stage by Obama, or there's a clip from a few weeks ago where he's in the White House garden. It's something with African-Americans. It's everybody around him is African-American. They're kind of dancing to music. And Biden is unbelievably stiff. It's like there's a mind frozen in a body. If you're surprised by the old liberal bumper sticker is if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. If you're surprised, you're not paying attention. And this gets to the willfulness of it. One of the things you learn in Washington is how fearful people are of being outside of a consensus and how fearful people are of being bereft of influence. And when the White House is turning around and saying nothing to see here, to challenge that, whether you are a sitting member, whether you are a lobbyist, whether you are a politico, or whether you are a member of the media is career threatening. For all the media wants to say, we're champions of truth, we're paladins of investigation, that opposite is true. Almost every significant media person derives their influence through sources, and those sources are on the inside. And it's true in both parties. It's true across the political spectrum. There's very little actual investigation challenging of power. And so the question is, if your influence derives from sources and your sources are afraid, you're going to be afraid. Because the alternative is that you're going to put your career on the line. And very few people are ever willing to put their career on the line, left, right, and center. What can we infer about where and how power is exercised in this White House? One, I mean, it's hard to know, especially for me and you, we're not physicians, how much someone can do behind the scenes. In other words, like how much of Joe Biden's difficulty is performative? And how much of it is actually like, you know, behind the scenes that is actually challenging to doing his job? And to the extent that that is the case, who would be in a position to actually, you know, make decisions to the White House? We know that Jill Biden has played a, an outsized role, perhaps similar to what Nancy Reagan played in the last years of, of Ronald Reagan's administration. Hunter Biden, apparently, there's a lot of speculation about him being in some of these staff meetings. It's unclear what his role is which also kind of raises another question, which I had uh, posed to you earlier, and I might as well throw it in here, which is, you know, to what degree is Biden's recalcitrance a, uh, in, an indication of his concern that after he steps down, he will be selectively prosecuted by Donald Trump in the same way that he prosecuted Donald Trump, that the same thing will happen to his son, Hunter, and that he can't rely on anyone else to pardon them. So those are kind of two questions. Let's, again, let me restate my initial one, which is, Given his condition, what can we surmise about who is exercising power in this White House? Who are the people close to him? What does that look like? What do you understand that that looks like? So I have believed from day one that Biden has been conserving his energy, that domestic decisions are outside the highest level decisions, primarily being made by the inner circle, the chief of staff and domestic policy advisor and so forth. And you get a sense of that from going back to 2021 when people were saying the president isn't engaging on his own bill. We're not getting decisions as quickly as we want. This is during the Build Back Better days and when Biden was much more in command. Now, I think partially that's because if you have a limited mindset or limited bandwidth, you're going to choose the things that you care most about. I believe Ronald Reagan in his second term recognized he was slowing down and focused on the war with the Soviets. Because if you can only really focus eight hours a day or seven hours a day, you're going to focus on the most important thing. And Joe Biden's always cared most about foreign policy. I think that that's been a case in his administration from day one. I think increasingly what's happening is that his 
ability to concentrate throughout the day is less and less. And so you hear these rumors of people saying, we're not getting access to the president. We're being told the president has considered this decision, but we have no idea if it's actually the president or if it is his inner aides. I think that means that decisions are being made outside of the president's knowledge. Of course, the White House denies that, but the White House also has been telling us there's nothing to see here. You know, it's kind of like the guard on the street of Faber as everything breaks down an animal house and he says, yells, stay calm, all is well. Well, that's the White House. And what's going on, the chaos in back of you is the actual situation. So I think what's been going on is increasingly decisions are not being made by the president, except at the highest, highest level. I doubt that decisions about arms to Ukraine are being made outside the president's ambit. But I do suspect that decisions on things like student loans are being presented to the president. You need to do this. And he says yes, rather than the president actually being engaged in this. And I think everybody has suspected this for a while, but it's hard not to believe that they now don't know it, even if they can't confirm it. What about rumors about Hunter Biden and Jill Biden's roles in this administration and in influencing the president's decision to remain in the race? Yeah, I think that's, I don't think they're influencing policy. I don't think Jill Biden is sitting down with Biden, you know, with Tony Blinken and saying, well, you know, I think that what we need to do in Venezuela is have this discussion with Maduro in the run up to the July presidential election. I don't think Jill Biden is doing that. And I know Hunter is not doing that. But I do think we're at the point where Joe Biden trusts the family. And I think they want to do what's right for dad or husband. And I think they know that dad or husband wants desperately to stay in the race. So what they're doing is protecting that decision. Do they agree with it? I've long suspected that Jill doesn't agree with it, but she loves her husband. Her husband's definite, and she's not going to be the person who goes against that until he asks her. I don't think he's at the point of asking her. Your question of personal prosecution, I do think that if Joe Biden whether he runs and loses or whether he runs, does not run. I do think that if he sees a time when he is no longer going to be president, he will preemptively pardon his son. I do not think Hunter will serve jail time if he does not go to jail during a Biden presidency where he is actively running for reelection because he loves his son. And I don't think he thinks his son deserves to go to prison for whatever he did. Um, with respect to personal prosecution, there may be some fear of that, but I don't think that's driving the decision. I think what's driving the decision is I'm the president of the United States. I can do the job. Uh, I can beat Donald Trump. Uh, get out of the way. In a sense, what we're seeing is an old man who is telling the Democratic Party to get off his political lawn. Ego, a very strong ego and a sense of identity and an unwillingness to let go. I like I like that you framed it this way because when uh, Joe Biden ran in 2020, there was a, a narrative and also there was a sense just based on how old he looked at the time that he was doing this for the country, that he was taking one for the team, that he didn't want to run, that he wanted to, to retire, that he wanted to move on with his life, but that he was going to do it, that he was going to put himself through this all this difficulty in order to right the ship and prepare it for the handoff to the next generation. And it seems that that was just never true, that actually, in point of fact, he wanted to be president and he really wants to remain president of the United States to this day. Absolutely. It was always a pleasant fiction. He may very well be also motivated, as he says, by what happened in Charlottesville and so forth. I'm not discounting that. But the fact is, this is a man who's wanted to be president since at least his 20s. You don't run for the Senate at the age of 29, you know, turning 30 between the election and the oath of office so that he could constitutionally qualify and is talking about the presidency as early then runs in 1988 and has to drop out because of a plagiarist scandal in 1987. This is a guy who's wanted the presidency all his life. You don't give up that dream. You just don't. And it would be nice to think that he were self-facing enough, selfless enough, that he could say, it's my time. And there are times in history where people have done that, but they are rare and they often are accompanied by 
some sort of pressure. If we had a Westminster system, a parliamentary system, Joe Biden would have been removed as leader years ago because there would have been leverage that Winston Churchill was 80 or 81 when he resigned under pressure because his age no longer allowed him to be prime minister. And so I don't think that's because Winston Churchill, who had wanted to be prime minister again since his 20s, sat there and said, well, you know, it's time for me to go. I think it's a combination of things. And so this whole idea of selfless Joe was always a pleasant fiction. And now we're seeing exactly how fictional it is because he has a successor, Kamala Harris. He has clear reason to step down and say, I've given it my all. And yet he's going to go out fighting tooth and nail, even if he does end up withdrawing ostensibly of his own accord before the convention. So now that we've laid out a few facts about the situation as it currently is and speculated a bit on Joe Biden's condition, I think the next stage of this conversation is to speculate a bit more about the plausibility that uh, he actually finishes the race. I'm curious to understand what your view on this is. Do you think that this is likely to happen? How do you handicap it? And how soon do you think it could happen? I think that it is still likelier to happen than not. By likelier to happen, I don't mean that he'll stay in the race. I mean, I think it is likelier that he drops out than it is not. Why do I think that? I think that because it's been clear for quite some time that Joe Biden is running uphill against the most unpopular Republican nominee in history. This is a man whose job approval ratings remain the lowest in the history of polling, which goes back to the 1940s. This is a man who re has lower job approval ratings at this point in his presidency than Donald Trump did. That is why Joe Biden trailed Donald Trump in swing state polls and in national polling averages before the debate. Now, you look and say, well, he was only trailing nationally by a point and so forth. But the fact is, because of the Electoral College, Joe Biden basically has to win the national popular vote by two points or more to have a prayer of winning the Electoral College. So this is a guy who has strong opinions negative about him, running against a Republican who also has strong negative opinions. He spent tens of millions of dollars unanswered on advertising. He has spent a lot of time lambasting Trump as an enemy of democracy, somebody who will ban abortion nationwide, who is basically the parade of evils, you know, the, the monsters under the bed. Imagine what you're afraid of Donald Trump represents it. And nothing has changed. Does anyone think that a Donald Trump who no longer has to worry about significant trials eating up his time in the fall, who has weathered a conviction, as they keep reminding us, of 34 different felony counts without a blip? Does anyone think that a Donald Trump who is now free to campaign and has more cash on hand can't widen his lead against Joe Biden? And this is before the debate. Now you have the fact that at any time Trump is on the stage, he will bring up Joe Biden's condition. If I were Donald Trump, one thing I would do is immediately launch into a physically exhausting cross-country trip, whether it's in I'd do it in August in the run-up before the Democratic convention just to remind people who they're running against Trump, you know, which is, say, somebody who couldn't do it. If Donald Trump can hack it, and I think he can, I would have two events a day for seven days in a row that go cross-country. I'd start in Nevada. I'd go to Arizona. I'd go to every swing state. And literally every time I'd say, this is a 24-7, 365 job. I can do it. If you think Joe Biden could do what I'm doing, you're crazy. And I think people will agree with that after this debate. So you look at this and you say, how could he come back before the debate? And after the debate, I think it, it's delusional to think that Joe Biden can make this ground up. And I think every serious Democrat knows that. Some people will say it publicly. Others, like Nancy Pelosi, say it without saying it publicly. And they have no leverage other than shame and uh, trying to reduce Biden's chance of doing it by telling Democrats, this guy's not fit. This guy and can't do it. Uh, I just think the pressure will eventually build up on Biden in some time 
after the Republican convention, he's going to uh, see the writing on the wall. And then the only question is, does he stay as president or does he resign the presidency and make Kamala Harris the incumbent, which would be the strongest position for Harris and the strongest position in some ways for the Democrats. But uh, I just do not see how he doesn't. I can imagine that he doesn't ultimately come to this decision, but I think the odds are high that he does. And that's really a question of when. I do have a follow-up question about when uh, he will bow out, but you mentioned his job approval rating. I find this hard to understand because we've had presidents in the past who have found themselves in a worse position during their presidency than Biden is today, objectively speaking. Nixon in, in 73, 74, and Jimmy Carter after Operation Eagle Claw, or uh, Bush towards the tail end of his administration with the Iraq war not going the way, or the Iraq occupation not going the way that uh, Rumsfeld and uh, the neocons had promised, or the 2008 financial crisis. So what explains the vitriol that so many people feel and the very low, as you said, historically low job approval rating that Joe Biden has in 2024? What I would say is, first of all, most of those examples that you gave are in the second half of the second or the second term when the person can't run for re-election. Well, except for Jimmy Carter, yeah. Right. And the fact is that Biden's approval ratings are lower than Jimmy Carter's were after Operation Eagle Claw, the failed. Which is shocking. Not just Operation Eagle Claw, but stagflation and you know, gas prices that the country had never seen before. Yeah, I lived through that. Not just gas prices, but gas rationing where literally people had to line up for hours to get gas because not only was it expensive, it wasn't available. A couple of things. First of all, Joe Biden promised a return to normalcy. What do people think of a return to normalcy? You know, the end, the reduction in partisan bickering, return to peace and prosperity. So what do we have? The highest inflation in over 40 years, a rocky recovery that seems to be helping people in the top half of the income distribution, but not people in the bottom half. We have record high chaos on our border, which is directly caused by Joe Biden. We have two wars going on that the Americans are directly involved in, even though our troops are not at risk. And we have a president who is historically old and historically feeble. This is not normal. He promised a return to normalcy, and we have abnormalcy on steroids. It's not the type of abnormalcy we had in the first Trump term, but then people look and say, well, we have incredibly crazy politics, but peace and prosperity and a border that's controlled. On the balance, I'd rather have that. And so you have the fact that Biden's presidency is not the most successful in modern history, which is what we're being told by Democrats, but is in fact, at best, an uneven presidency in terms of its accomplishments, compounded by the clear sense before the debates and the ultra clear sense after the debate that this guy's not up to the job. It's not a condemnation of his goodwill or his moral faculties. It's a clear eyed judgment of his physical and mental capacity. You know, people age at different rates. Chuck Grassley is 90 and he was still doing push ups last year. And you listen to him and yeah, he's slowed down, but he's sharp. Bernie Sanders is sharp. Joe Biden is not. Yeah. So I was actually having a conversation with uh, my friend John Askinus recently who had been on the podcast a year or two ago for an episode on consensus reality. He had written a great piece for the New Atlantis called What Happened to Consensus Reality? And I was telling him that the way that the Democrats and the media are talking about Joe Biden's condition is there's so much gaslighting going on. And in general, there has been so much gaslighting going on, both on the Republican and on the Democrat side, that I feel like I had this moment of realization that like, oh, I can see how a society can go from a rational, empirically based understanding of reality and a sort of consensus view of how we arrive at the truth to a world where really we become completely unmoored from any objective reality. And at that point, it's quite frightening how a country is supposed to govern. I also, I want to recommend listeners go back and listen to my conversation with Peter Pomerantsev, who wrote a book called 
Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which was about his experience working in post-Soviet Russia in the TV industry and describing this move away from the ideologically based propaganda of the Soviet period to this nihilistic version of the media landscape during the Putin era and how that eventually bled into the media landscape in the West. And I've lived through this. Again, people know I had a television show on RT. I actually worked directly with the higher ups in, in uh, Russia Today's news organization. So I've seen this happen firsthand. And I find it deeply troubling that now the Democrats who are supposed to represent the establishment and the established media and sanity are actually gaslighting the nation about Joe Biden's condition, which is manifestly bad. And everyone can see it's bad. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is that increasingly people are been taking sides and you're either on team red or you're on team blue. Now, a lot of Americans are on team purple. And that's one of the reasons why you see this growing dissatisfaction, which is I don't want to be in this nihilistic Ragnarok Armageddon style battle. But that's increasingly the way the political forces see themselves. And there certainly are millions, tens of millions of people on each side who are driving this and part of this. But when you're in Team Red and Team Blue, you have an incredibly strong incentive to interpret the world in a way that reinforces your orthodoxies, that it is the emperor has no clothes writ large, and not just about one thing, but about the world. And so, you know, I'm thinking about Joe Biden's condition. And I remember when Joe, Donald Trump walking gingerly down a platform at the West Point graduation elicited a front page New York Times story. Can he do the job? which was ludicrous. And I wrote an article defending Trump. You can say you can say a lot of things about Trump, but actually look at the clip. This is not based on reality. It's the one time I got name checked by President Trump is he liked that, couldn't believe the Washington Post let me say that, blah, blah, blah. And we have had multiple things that are worse about Joe Biden that barely get mentioned in the press or have in the mainstream press. And then you have the gaslighting on the other side. We've been hearing Joe Biden has dementia from the conservative media, not since day one, but pretty early in the administration. Joe Biden did not have dementia in 2021 or 2022. He was an old man who was slowing down and increasingly had some difficulties in forming thoughts and expressing them. But that's not dementia. But yet you have millions of people who believe that he's been basically weekend at Bernie's dead and being propped up since 2021. That is also false. But why do you have this? You have this because if the world is team red versus team blue, saying something that's not convenient to the orthodoxies gets you in trouble. It means you're not on the team anymore. The thing about the debate is you can't argue that A is not A. And Joe Biden was so manifestly incapable on a live setting that tens of millions of people watch that you can't stay with the line in a way that is belied by facts that people themselves saw. And that's what you've been seeing over the last three weeks is the people who had been seeing the world in a way consistent with Team Blue orthodoxies just can't do it anymore because you can't literally say, don't believe me, don't believe your eyes. Now, the White House is still basically spreading that, but it's not believable. It's just not believable. So back to uh, prognostications about Biden stepping down. I asked you, how soon do you think this could happen? Do you think it's more likely to happen after NATO and the Democratic convention, but before the Republican convention willfully? Or do you think he's going to, again, it has to be willful technically, but that he'll basically just be forced to step down by virtue of the circumstances after the Republican convention in a really chaotic way? Yeah. So I think that he will not step down during the NATO summit. I mean, that would be an incredible abdication of his global authority. It would be a humiliation of global impact. He will not do it. So then you have the question of that's over Thursday evening, Eastern time. It'll be tomorrow, our time, and a few days before this episode comes out. So what that means is, will he 
stepped down on the weekend before or during the Republican convention, which starts on July 15th? I think not. And I think not because, first of all, this is the day when the time when the Republicans are going to be getting their week in the sun. I don't think you want the story competing with that is Democrats in disarray, historic step down. Who are they running? Because then you've got a clear Republican strength versus Democratic weakness. I don't think you want that to be the story. So you let the Republicans have their shots at decrepit Joe or whatever nicknames Donald Trump is going to come up with. And then you have the Friday of the week after the Republican convention concludes Thursday night. I think that's when the real speculation starts. And I think Joe Biden, unless he really holds out till the end, will make his irrevocable decision no later than August 10th, a week or so before the Democratic convention starts, just because I don't think you want the story of the Democratic convention to be Monday, the president steps down a 72 hour race to succeed him. I think the more time they have, the better, unless he's going to resign the presidency, in which case Kamala Harris steps up to become the president. I don't think anyone is going to challenge an incumbent president when the circumstances of her ascension are historical. So if Biden really wants to set the agenda, he steps down, makes her the president and gives her, passes the torch to her completely. In the absence of that, you need time to set up what's going to happen for people to decide what they're going to do. And I think the more time, the better. And I think sometime no later than a week before the beginning of the Democratic convention in Chicago is the real deadline for Biden getting out of the race. In Chicago, right? I mean, this is, you couldn't have written a more perfect script. I would have told you, if you had told me the story a few years ago, I'd say it's fake. It's on many levels Shakespearean. So like, let's assume, let's put aside the question of when and how this mechanically happens. Let's move now to like who replaces Biden. First of all, in terms of process, what do you think the best process is by which to select a candidate to replace him, assuming that he doesn't abdicate the presidency and let Camilla Harris become the incumbent? So I think what you're looking at is a series of unpalatable options. If Biden gets out of the race but does not resign the presidency, he releases his delegates, but they are then formally uncommitted that you don't have his ability to pledge his delegates to somebody else. That colors the whole race. The question is, will people simply accept the vice president stepping in or will other people challenge her? I think you're seeing Team Kamala or Team Kamala pushing the idea that she is part of the administration. If he has to step down, she is the only option for them. And consequently, I think that it is very, very likely that she is going to be the replacement. I didn't think that about a week and a half ago, but there seems to be little appetite for taking her on directly. It doesn't mean that there won't be a challenge. It might actually be better for her if there were, because then she could step out from behind a shadow and demonstrate strength. But if you're looking at this historically, you have 1968, Democratic incumbent president steps aside for re-election, forces the vice president on a brokered convention on the Democratic Party over complaints from the left. You have a hot summer with protests from people dissatisfied with the war in Vietnam. Here you might have the war in Iraq, uh, not Iraq, in Israel. The parallels are kind of eerie, as a matter of fact, or the potential parallels. Well, thankfully, no assassinations. I mean, you had RFK and we had both Bobby's assassination after California and uh, Martin Luther King's as well. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that's changed since 1968 with that respect is much greater security. Let's remember how RFK was assassinated. He was sitting senator from New York, former attorney general, brother of the president, front runner who had just confirmed it. And he walked out in a hotel through the kitchen and a guy shot him in the kitchen. Nobody would get that close to any political event without having passed through 
a metal detector these days, but they didn't do it in 1968. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's just unlikely that you have a political assassination because we've enhanced security so that people can't get that close anymore in most settings without having gone through various levels of security that people just didn't think were necessary in 1968. So you mentioned Kamala. What are the specific concerns about Kamala Harris? Because I I have also sort of defaulted to the view that she's horrible, that she can't win. I've felt this way for a while. But when I actually you know, prepared for this conversation and asked myself, well, what specifically are the reasons that I think she wouldn't be successful? I just kind of fell back on you know, basic feelings that I have from a bunch of clips that I've seen on the internet. You know what I mean? On paper, you could argue that she's the perfect person to take on Donald Trump because she's a former prosecutor. Donald Trump's in the middle of you know several prosecutions. And she's also a woman during the whole debate about Roe v. Wade and the potential implications of a second Trump turn and conservatives in the White House, uh, the replacement of Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor. So why is she so bad? What's the, What are the concerns about her being an effective candidate? Yeah, the concerns are a couple. Well, first of all, those clips on the internet, they're not damning like Biden, but they do pretty much show that this is a person who can lapse into incomprehensibility of being vague in a new or new age sort of way. Is it the inauthenticity of Kamala Harris that bothers people similar to what we had with Hillary Clinton? Is that really what you're talking to? When you listen to these clips on the internet, this is a person who seems overwhelmed by actually being a national figure. You need to have a command of facts and a clear direction if you're going to be a national figure. And so she lapses into these weird word salads, which have been lampooned on The Daily Show in skits where they take her on, have a new age word advisor saying, you know, she can be understood as kind of the process of putting words together. It's kind of funny. But I think that's one concern. The other thing is the administration. We've been told for four years it's the Biden-Harris administration. Congratulations. People don't like the Biden-Harris administration. Her job approval ratings are roughly on par with Joe Biden's, and she bears the burden of an unpopular, unsuccessful administration. So I think those are the two things. And then you have the third thing, which is this is a woman who ran for president, who was one of the leading contenders in the beginning of 2019, who fizzled out so completely she dropped out months before the Iowa caucus. She didn't excite black voters. She didn't excite progressives. She didn't excite moderate liberals. She didn't excite anyone. And you see the same things that she would, once she was in charge of the campaign, she'd say one thing, then she'd retract it. She didn't know what she was about. And so while you'd say, yeah, her slogan was Kamala Harris for the people, which was a play on being for the people as a prosecutor is the prosecutor for the people. But when you're a prosecutor, you're making a case. In politics, you have to make a case. Kamala Harris couldn't make a case. She couldn't decide what she wanted people to believe about her. And so consequently, people believed nothing about her. They believed she wasn't up for the job. The question is, has she learned in four years? how to make a case. We know she can make a negative case. It's easy for a Democrat to make a negative case. Donald Trump will ban abortion. Donald Trump is a danger to democracy. Donald Trump will start World War III. We've been hearing this. She can just make that case. Can't she make a case for herself? If the negative case were going to work, I think you would see Biden have been ahead in the polls. Instead, the negative case has not overwhelmed the negative perceptions of Biden in the administration. Yet the Biden hierarchy seems to believe that doing the same thing and expecting a different result over the last four months of the campaign will result in victory. Well, there's a word for doing the same thing and expecting different results. It's called insanity. And I think that is where a Harris campaign would be. And it's not to say she couldn't, you know, maybe it's all more sense of Biden's too old rather than a genuine distaste for the administration. But I actually think there's a lot of substance, not just fluff or personality judgments or suitability, fitness judgments that go into those low approval ratings. And I think it'll be difficult for Harris to overcome that 
particularly given her demonstrated lack of ability to clearly have the firm ability to state a positive case about herself and the administration. One more question about this, Henry, before I move us to the second hour, and that is which candidate, potential Democrat candidate, if any, do you think is in a position to give Donald Trump a run for his money? Were that candidate to be selected to run against Donald Trump in 2024? I think the best candidate that the Democrats could choose would be Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan. And I think they should pair her with Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia. Why do I think that? First of all, she's either 52 or 54. I forget which. So you have a clear generational shift. She has won a key swing state twice and delivered a majority in the legislature for Democrats. She's shown she can win in tough circumstances. She's not going to make anyone compare her to Martin Luther King, but she can put words together. She's not somebody who lapses into vague word salad. She's not somebody who is unfit for the job. She is a person in her prime. And I think she would be able to both make a positive case, as she had to do for herself twice as governor or candidate for governor of Michigan. And I think she would be able to make the case that Democrats want to make, which is abortion is on the ballot very effectively. I think the fact that she wouldn't be tied to the Biden-Harris administration means that she could pivot from it, praise the accomplishments, but show that she's a different person. Harris can't do that. Certainly, she can't do it with Joe in the White House. This was the problem with Humphrey and Johnson in 1968. Humphrey needed to pivot away from the Johnson administration's prosecution of the war in Vietnam, but he couldn't do it because Johnson was in the White House running the war in Vietnam. I think that Whitmer would be able to do it. Warnock would be the perfect running mate because, first of all, he too is eloquent, more eloquent than she, as you would expect from the person who's the successor as the lead pastor in Martin Luther King's Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. This guy can talk and he can move audiences. He, unlike Harris, does generate enthusiasm in the black community. And the erosion of democratic support among black voters has been one of the biggest worries that they have, that there's little reason to believe that Kamala Harris can attract particularly black men away from Donald Trump. She put a lot of them in jail for smoking marijuana after she laughed about conceding that she actually had done the same thing on Charlemagne's podcast some years ago. Yeah. And believe me, the Trump campaign will remind black voters of that, that, you know, who signed the Second Chance Act? Me. Who put you in jail? Her. So you've got Raphael Warnock. He has won two very tough elections in another key swing state, Georgia. If the Democrats can hold Michigan and Georgia, it makes Trump's ability to win the Electoral College very, very hard. And if Whitmer can hold Michigan, she probably has the sort of appeal that allows them to hold either Wisconsin or Pennsylvania. And so I look at this and I think, If I were the Democrats, that's the ticket I would choose. And I think that would cause Trump a lot of trouble because he's prepared to run against an administration that they'll distance themselves from it. And he's prepared to run against people whose eloquence will remind nobody of Ronald Reagan against people who actually can probably out talk Trump. So as I said, Henry, I'm going to move to the second hour. I want to start that conversation on the other side by asking you what you think that this election is about what the Democrats want to make it about, what they think it's about, what the Republicans want to make it about, and also what the critical voters actually think and feel that this election is about. I also want to discuss election integrity because this is a subject that hasn't come up recently because we've been swapped by Biden and also by Biden's health questions. And also Trump has really been out of the spotlight. He's no longer on Twitter. The media doesn't cover him. And so in some ways you could argue they've been doing him a big favor because he hasn't had to actually be out there saying things and doing things that turn off the independent voters who were up for grabs. But I I want to know what, what you know is being done both from a narrative standpoint, which is just simply sort of what are the Democrats doing to try and make voters feel comfortable about the process? And then in reality, what's being done? Because people have so many doubts. I also want to understand what states are critical and what are the polls showing in terms of how some potential candidates, we mentioned Kamala, there's also uh, Gavin Newsom, whoever might potentially run. 
We haven't had a chance to talk about Trump's VP. He's been teasing that recently. We might actually have in concrete information about who that is by the time this episode airs, but I want to ask you about it. And largely, we haven't had a chance to talk about Trump. I mean, we've spent this entire time talking about Biden, which is, again, part of the problem for the Biden team, which is they don't want people talking about him. They want the spotlight on Donald Trump. And as long as Biden's health questions are out there, that is the single, I mean, you know, nothing else really needs to happen for him to lose the election because people aren't focused on Trump and all the ways they don't like him, at least the voters who are up for grabs. So I want to understand, you know, what the Trump campaign 2024 looks like. How does it compare to the previous campaign? How is he running it? Is he more hands-on? Who is running it? What the platform is? What are some of the key policy proposals? Who would staff his cabinet? What his economic policy looks like? And where we are with the Trump trials? Like where is this situation pretty much resolved until the time that the election is over? Is it resolved permanently because of the Supreme Court decision? So all of these are questions that I want to ask you the second hour, Henry. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Henry, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Henry, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas. And you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.